The next unit in our proposed curricula for science literacy is one I call the landscape of science. What do I mean by landscape? Well, it's a metaphor, obviously, but it starts with the observation that there are distinct scientific disciplines. Here are six that span the physical, biological, and social domains. Of course, there are many other branches of science, and there are many subdisciplines within each of these categories. So this list is obviously incomplete. But for now, let's take this list as representative. Representative of what? Representative of the breadth and diversity of science. Representative of the fact that, while these branches of science might have a lot in common, they're also very different from one another. So let's push the landscape metaphor further. Scientists are explorers, but they're not all exploring the same terrain. Physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, sociology, economics, these are like different territories or realms within the landscape of science. Training to be a scientist is like training to become a specific kind of expert explorer. Learning how to climb and explore mountains is very different from learning to explore deserts or tundras or jungles or ocean floors. Now, early on, you'll get some instruction in two or three other environments, but very quickly, you have to specialize in one environment, one kind of terrain, and learn the skills necessary to master that terrain. Eventually, you may become an expert undersea explorer or an expert mountain climber, but these are two very different skill sets. Being an expert in one doesn't make you an expert in the other. Similarly, you can be an expert in psychology, but only have a cursory knowledge of chemistry or physics or economics and vice versa. Now, this narrowing of disciplinary focus is necessary to become a skilled researcher in a scientific field, but it's not conducive to science literacy. Being literate in science means having some idea of the key ideas and methods of science across a range of scientific fields and have some idea of how these different fields relate to each other. That's what it means to have an understanding of the landscape of science. Science literacy doesn't require that you be an expert explorer in all these terrains or even an amateur explorer. What it requires is landscape literacy. You need to understand what a mountain environment looks like and how that's different from other environments. What sorts of skills a mountain climber has to have to successfully climb mountains and how those differ from skills needed to explore oceans and so forth. So just to back away from the metaphor a bit, a person who's literate in science should be able to tell you something about how natural sciences differ from social sciences, how physical sciences differ from biological sciences, how law-based sciences like physics differ from historical sciences like evolutionary theory or geology, how formal sciences like computer science differ from natural sciences, and so on. These aren't particularly hard questions to answer. You don't need to know much detailed science to gain some kind of understanding of how physics and biology differ from one another. Now, a person who's literate in science should also be able to tell you something about how different sciences relate to one another and have some idea of where controversies lie on the matter. Debates about reductionism and emergence in the sciences, for example, often come down to debates about how one field of science relates to another. We can ask, for example, whether chemistry is reducible to physics. If you get a handful of physicists and chemists in a room together and just throw out this question and ask them to respond on a piece of paper, I'll confidently bet $1,000 that you'll find at least one person who thinks that it's obviously true that chemistry is reducible to physics and another person who thinks it's obviously false. What you'll also find is that when you ask this handful of scientists to write down what they think it means to say that chemistry is reducible to physics, you'll get a range of responses. And it'll become obvious that if you want to have a productive conversation about the issue, you'll need to spend some time clarifying how different people use the terms reductionism and emergence. In particular, you'll need to be careful to distinguish metaphysical and epistemological senses of reduction and emergence, since these are, in fact, central to the debate. Now, this is the sort of discussion that almost never shows up in the curriculum of a traditional science education. It's treated as a philosophy of science question rather than a science question. But that's a silly distinction to draw. It's both a question for science and a question for the philosophy of science. In the case of the relation between physics and chemistry, the issue might seem to be of merely academic interest. But the general question of how one domain of science relates to another can make a real difference to how we view the world and how we view science. Consider this question. Is the behavior of social groups reducible to the behavior of individuals within those groups? This issue has been hotly debated throughout the history of the social sciences. It's tied up with a host of questions like, are there laws of social development and social change? Is social change predictable? And if so, on the basis of what? Is collective social behavior 
determined by the psychological states of individual people, or are those psychological states determined in part by social facts and social context? Now, these questions would seem to be very important if you wanted to not just understand society, but also to change it, to intervene in ways that will shift the direction of social change. And here's a disconcerting fact. Political policies and political movements, insofar as they are intentionally designed to bring about certain kinds of social change, necessarily take stances on these sorts of questions, whether we're aware of them or not. Now, I also appreciate the temptation to stuff these difficult questions in a box labeled for academics only, but that's the temptation I'm urging us to resist. One way to get at these questions without getting embroiled in narrow ideological disputes is to frame them as questions about the nature of social science and its relation to psychology, economics, and other branches of science. In other words, frame them as questions about the landscape of science. Here's another question that deals with the relationship between different branches of science. Does human consciousness emerge from brain activity? Could a computer ever be self-aware in the way that we are? This is obviously a hot topic today, but it's been seeping into our cultural consciousness for decades through movies and television. It's tempting to think that the popularity of this idea is just a reflection of our appetite for certain kinds of compelling stories, but the reality is that these stories reflect widely shared views within the scientific community about what is not just possible, but plausible. Of course, there are skeptics. There are plenty of scientists who think the answer is obviously yes, a computer could be self-aware in the way that we are, and there are plenty who say the answer is obviously no. The only point I really want to make here is that we can view this as a landscape of science question too. The whole question can be framed as a border dispute, a disagreement over how one region of the landscape of science relates to another. How does the domain of the mental relate to the domain of the physical? How does psychology relate to biology? How does the phenomenon of consciousness relate to the information processing activities of the brain and the body? Is the mental reducible in some sense to the physical? Does it emerge from the physical? These are difficult questions, obviously. Science literacy doesn't require that everyone be up on the latest journal articles on these topics, but it would be nice if people could at least recognize the questions and appreciate why they might be important. And this is just one of many examples like this. Being literate in the landscape of science makes it possible to engage in conversations about science and the direction of scientific research that may have huge social consequences for us in the near future or for future generations a little farther down the line. So this is the introduction to the fourth unit in our proposed Curriculum for Science Literacy. To sum up, what I propose to do in this unit is to give a guided tour of the main branches of science, highlight their defining features, and introduce some interesting and important debates that turn on how we think one area of science or one domain of the natural world relates to another. As a case study, we'll look at debates about reductionism and emergence. And I'll introduce some distinctions that are common in the philosophical literature and that I believe can help students think more clearly and ask more critical questions about these issues. Now, let's move on to the last unit in our proposed Curriculum for Science Literacy, which is on the ethics of science. 